Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, hopefully this will not take the entire two hours, um, but we did want to touch base with all of you to just give you some insight into some of the new regulations. Some of you have probably already read them. Um, some of you have probably participated in the DOL webinars that have been going on. Um, the last one is tomorrow for the phase one portion. Um, they did indicate there were going to be some more training later. But we wanted to touch base and give you some updates on some things that have changed and some of the forms that we have been revising and changing. Um, and all of this does take effect on Monday for this new final rule. So we'll go ahead and get started. If you do have any questions, you can put them in the chat pod. Uh, we will be answering those probably as we go along or towards the end. Um, if we don't have time to get to all of them, we will put a question and answer session out on WorkNet or send it out to all of you. So, get started. So, these new regulations, like I said, do go effect, into effect on Monday, September 21st. They are very similar to the already existing 2015 provision with a few changes. Um, <clears throat> there are some significant changes to the requirements for the IE and we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Um, they're very focused on the assessment of the participants and um, not only the initial assessment, but also the comprehensive and um, the comprehensive assessment for them to kind of, a, you know, determine what needs they have. Um, transportation, there is um, a major change in the transportation area of the regulations. Um, there is one piece of it we are waiting on an answer from DOL, which we have not received yet. So that could affect some things related to transportation. There are some significant changes with the job search area. We do not have all of our forms worked out for job search yet, but we are working on them. And if anyone does have a job search um, that comes up, then just please contact us and we will work through that together. And the merit staffing requirement, there's a change to that as well which you probably already know. <clears throat> so one of the big things that we've done on our form is we have tried to align more with WIOA with this, and we are referring to our trade effective workers on our forms as participants. So you will see participant rather than customer is the new term we're using for the participant's name and all of their information. Um, we will have policy updates forthcoming in the next few months. Uh, we have been working furiously since these regulations came out to revise our forms and to read through the regulations to see what needed to be changed, but we will be working on policy um, here in the next couple of weeks and hopefully have it revised by October, November is our plan, um, but we will work furiously on that as well. <clears throat> uh, we will also have additional training. This is only the first session of training that we will have related to all these regulations. So this is just kind of a high level thing. We just wanted you to be aware of the forms you needed to start using and things that have changed. So you can get rolling. Uh, we have some good news for you. We have eliminated some forms that you will no longer need to be using that we had before. One of them is the OSXB, the fact sheet for the trade training. That is now incorporated into the new IEP. The same with the Form 3E, the trade waiver from training fact sheet. We have incorporated those responsibilities into the IEP as well. You'll see that later. Form 17, the trade training approval affidavit. We've eliminated this form because we are requiring upload of documents for review and IWS for merit staff approval. So we decided we did not need this form any longer because we see the forms that we need to to make approval. Um, same thing with the Form 16, the waiver approval affidavit. We've eliminated that due to the requirement we have to upload documents for review and IWS. And the Form 7 is the individual training account. We still have that form, but we are no longer requiring it for review by merit staff for approval. The career planners are free to use that form as a planning tool if you need to, but we do not need it to be submitted to us as a part of any type of document upload or review process. So there's your good news. 
Um, here is the next two slides are a list of the new forms that we have made changes to, some of them minor, some of them significant, uh, that you need to begin using on September 21st, 2020 for any new customer that, or new participant that comes in and requests services as of that date. So the trade BRO has changed slightly. Um, the significant change on the Bureau, we'll get to some of the major changes on these later for most of these bigger forms. The Form 3, there's minor revisions to that. The 3A, 3B, 3C, 3D, they are revised. There are only minor revisions to those letters that um, you'll notice. You may not notice them, but there are just minor changes to those. The Form 5 has significant changes to it. The Form 5A is a new form that you will use for modifications to transportation and subsistence assistance for the customers. Yeah, I'm still calling them uh, The 5D is also a new form that we created for those customers who may be attending multiple locations for their training. Um, we have this a lot with nurses who do a lot of clinical site locations that they travel to. And we've had some situations where customers do attend an out-of-state training. So we needed a mechanism to calculate the out-of-state subsistence. So we included that as a part of that form there too. So those are two new forms, the 5A and 5B. The form six, slight changes to that. Um, the form six, A, the biweekly attendance. We hope we've made this better. Uh, we seem to think that it looks better but we'll see in practice. We've eliminated a few items on the form, made it a little more streamlined, so it's a little significant change. The form 6B, there was just some minor revisions to that. 6B, minor revision. 6E, there was some revision. Uh, there was some unnecessary information on that form, we felt, so we did revise that slightly. The form 11, the IDCS RCAA application did change. There is a new requirement that they must include bonuses and overtime as a part of the calculation for the wages. And those instruct instructions are updated and the form is also updated as well for that. And the form 14, Individual Employment Plan, that one has undergone a very significant re revamp. Um, it feels completely different than the old one. Sorry, my dog. Uh, and we plan to review all of these forms for a final draft as of today. We will have them uploaded into WorkNet by tomorrow morning so you can use them. So please go to WorkNet to get these forms to use beginning on Monday. So the one big thing that they are focusing on is the assessment, which is in section 618.335. For the initial assessment, that is to determine the best service strategy for the participant. Uh, one of the things that you look at is, is there suitable employment available? And if there is, then you would provide employment and case management services as appropriate to assist that participant in obtaining that suitable employment. If it's de determined that there is no suitable employment available for this participant, then you would provide the employment case management services appropriate or um, you could advise the worker to apply for training, depending on what that assessment determines. And that's what the career planner will work with the participants on. So then we have comprehensive and specialized assessments that they're requiring, and that's in 618.345. You must make these available to all trade affected workers, and these assessments must take into account the worker's goals and interests as they relate to any employment opportunities in the area or outside the area. And this must expand upon the initial assessment that you've completed for the worker, and it must focus on like their interests, their skills, any aptitudes that they have, and their abilities. And a part of this assessment also would identify any barriers that they have to meet those employment goals. And some of those assessments could include diagnostic testing tools and instruments, such as your tape testing, um, the career scope, one of the other ones that I can think of, and in-depth interviewing and evaluation with that participant. 
and your information from these assessments is used to determine the six criteria of training and make sure that they are met. So these, these are very, very important and there's a big focus on the assessment piece of things. So just be mindful of that, that when DOL does come out to monitor us, they will probably really focus on are these, do they have an in-depth assessment? Is it in the file? Have they done what's necessary? We've incorporated a lot of this information into the IEP, as you'll see later. So one of the things they have added this year too was that the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the staff that's performing these assessments. And these are the things that they say the, the career planners in this case would need to know. They need a knowledge of the local labor market, they need knowledge of local employer and occupational skill demands, hiring prerequisites for those occupations, and the ability to identify any transferable skills that the work has. And we do have a transferable skills checklist that um, you can use. It kind of ties in with the transferable skills section of the IEP that we have created. Uh, they need the ability to evaluate quickly, that worker's ability to conduct a self-directed job search, and the ability to identify any barriers that this worker has to employment. So there are still eight required case management services. Some of them are worded just a little differently. Again, they must all be offered to the worker, and they can be declined by the participant. They do not have to accept any of the services. The BRO, we updated, these are some of the sections we've updated. We updated the 16 the training section. We've updated the out of area job search section due to the new regulations. The out of area relocation section also was updated because of the new regulations. And then just some other minor revisions, some wording, some grammar, um, and things like that. So the IEP, significant changes with this. And we wanted to point out this section in the reg, the 618.350, paragraph G, it says, the state must make the trade effective worker aware of the advantages of receiving an IEP. However, a worker may refuse to complete an IEP. Since portions of the IEP are necessary to determine eligibility for job search allowances under subpart D and training under subpart F, a worker's refusal to provide necessary information, either as part of the IEP or outside of the IEP process, may result in a denial of those benefits and services. This is critical that this worker knows this, that they know that they can refuse this, but if they do, they could be denied some of the benefits and services. That is you know, significant. You need to make sure you are aware of that and that the worker is aware of it as well. So the IEP has significantly changed, and we'll show, I'll show it to you here in a minute. We have added a lot of check boxes and click for date boxes to hopefully make it more, not as, not as challenging to complete for the career planner. Um, there are a lot of new sections, a lot of information. And this has to be completed with significant career planner and participant involvement. It can't be that you just fill it out for them. No, they have to sign an initial some sections on this, so the participant needs to be heavily involved in the completion of this. We have um, added to several sections the initials for the participant where they agree to these services. Um, there's check boxes for transferable skills, check boxes for the barriers to employment, so you won't have to hand write those in anymore or type them in. Um, we've added determination section. We've added a trade services section, a co-enrollment agreement section. Co-enrollment is a big, big thing for the new regulations. Of course, Illinois has been co-enrolling for over 10 years now, so that isn't such a major factor for us in these regs, but some of the states, they, they didn't require co-enrollment, so it'll require some major changes for them. So, blessing for us. We've added a WIOA services section for uh, customers who receive any kind of WIO or services. We've added the participant responsibilities on there that they have to sign and initial that they agree to these. And this is where we've also added our waiver responsibilities that eliminated Form 3B and the training responsibilities that eliminated 6B. <clears throat> so they have to indicate they agree to 
abide by this. And the participant should be given a copy of this IEP when it's completed and signed by everyone so they are aware when they have it, they have a document. Uh, we've added trade training benchmark information. We've updated the modification section to make it a little easier to complete when you're doing a modification, added some checkboxes. Um, and then we have a transferable skills checklist and a budget worksheet that coincides with this IEP that you can use when you're working with this customer and it'll help you complete it. Okay, so let me get the IEP open here. And you can see it. So I'm going to run through it really quickly. Um, if you have questions afterwards, or I, I can't see the chat pod at this point, but um, if you do have questions, then you can let us know. Uh, so we have the participant information, just their basic information that's needed, uh, the participant number, the name of the worker group, because that is referenced in the new regulation, the name of the worker group, um, the employment status of the participant, so you would mark the appropriate box. Um, and then your qualifying separation date, you would click and enter that date. And then we still have our employment and case management services. They look a little differently. Um, like you would put the distilled of date offered, date provided. Uh, you know, participant agrees to that service or that particular case management item and their initials and then the date. So there's still the A. They just worded a little differently. Um, the comprehensive and specialized assessment does have the subgroups of the diagnostic testing and the in-depth interviewing. Then we have our transferable skills checklist information. The transferable skills checklist does have these major categories on them, and within those major categories, there are subsets of specific skills within that particular um, major grouping, and you can use that once they fill that out to complete this section here. And in our barriers to employment, we put some of the most most seen type of barriers that customers could have. So you would check the appropriate boxes and put any additional comments that you might have or if there's an other mark of what it is, what what is that barrier. Um, if you refer them to a partner, you know, if they're recommending that, yes or no, and the participant agrees to that, yes or no. Um, and then here's some of the other partners that you may refer them to. Or if you've got another one that isn't listed, you can list it over here. So then you have your prior work history, which that was on the other IEP. It just looks a little bit differently. Not as much information is required this time. Um, the education history, again, that was included on the other IEP previously, but it looks just a little bit different. Um, again, not as much information being requested. And then here is where the initial assessment is. So you have several options here. You know, you provide a participant with information on the local market conditions, the you know, education. I mean, these are the things that you would determine based on this initial assessment, things that you would do as a part of that initial assessment. You would mark these as you complete them. So after this initial assessment, then you have your determination of your services, and you would make the determination suitable employment available for the participant. They would benefit from additional employment and management services. Okay. Does the participant agree with this assessment outcome? Yes or no? They initial. If they say no, then you provide the reason, you know, and you would put that in here. And if they answer no, then you could do these additional comprehensive and specialized assessments with them to make it a, a further determination. So then you have the determination no suitable employment is available to the participant. They would benefit from additional services or they would, you would advise them to go for training. So this is all part of that whole assessment package that they're very, very focused on this year. And then you would have your participant occupational goals. So what's their targeted occupation? Or what's the targeted industry? Um, what's the ONET? Your projected wage per hour? 
you know, a little bit extra information here on the occupational goal than what was originally on the other IEP. Uh, and then your statement of your occupational goal. So you would select one of these. We need to revise the lining up of these a little bit, so we'll fix that before you get it. So does everyone suit the need of that customer or that participant, what their occupational goal is going to be? You would select one of those. And then you're going to mark the trade services that the participant's going to be enrolled in. Obviously, everyone's going to need an IEP unless they decline it. So you would mark IEP. Um, if they need a waiver, then you would do this. You know, there's all the different services here, transportation, trade case management, which everyone will need that, obviously, if they're in training or anything. If you're working with them, they need trade case management services. And again, <laughs> if the participant agrees or not agrees to these services, you put the date offered, date provided, and their initials. Then you get into the training section. So you assess their financial resources. You know, are they going to get UI, CRA? Do they get financial aid? Have they filled out the monthly budget expense form? If you've got your own, you can use it. You don't have to use the one that we have, but we just provided it as a sample in case you needed one. Um, and, you, and then you mark that it has been in the good place in the participant files, the participant, by, you know, initials that, okay, yes, I agree to that. I, I agree with that assessment of the financial resources. Then the training goal. What, what's their training program? What are they going to do? Which program are they going to be enrolled in? And then you get into the types of training for the participant. You've got your occupational and vocational. Do they agree to this? Who's the training provider? What's the training program name? Again, your date offered, provided, start date, end date, system initial, total week. The same thing for remedial. Then we have some categories of remedial that you can check. Uh, we have prerequisites. If there's any prerequisites, and prerequisites are not, you have to take Biology 101 before Biology 102. Prerequisites is more for, as, a, as an example, like nursing, you have, to, you have to meet so many prerequisite requirements before you can actually get accepted into the LPN or the RN program. So that's what a prerequisite would be. Um, a lot of colleges and universities, they, they they don't understand what we mean by prerequisites, but they, their prerequisites are different. Uh, we have on-the-job training, many of those customers that would have customized training. And then we have pre-apprenticeship training or apprenticeship training. So folks, they're focusing on apprenticeships. If anyone can, you know, find an avenue to do some apprenticeship training, that would be great. Just, you know, work with us on that if you do find something like that. Um, or there's some short-term pre-vocational training, any other kind of training that they may may need that you can enroll them in, you can mark that here. And if they mark no to any of these services that, and it, it's not like, okay, if they're not going to do apprenticeship training, you don't have to mark no. It's, if, for instance, you, you say, okay, we'll enroll you in this occupational training, well, they don't want to enroll in an occupational training and they would they would not agree to that, that's what this statement is for. That's the no. It's not that they're just not doing them. If they're not doing one of them, you just don't work. And then here is where you list the number of training weeks for each of the various categories. And the all other training is grouped together for some of these other items that we don't see very often. And then here's where you would put your total trade cost of training. Put your tuition and fees. This is basically off of the, the ITA information, um, all the same categories. Tuition and fees, transportation, any subsistence, required books, equipment, supplies, and consumables. And we also have a new category here that's testing and certification because we can pay for testing and certification um, with the new regulations, but we just can't pay for the travel to go to them. But we can pay for the testing and certification. And you, but you need to include them as a part of the original IEP when you're doing them. And if you just have an estimate, that's fine. But make sure you include them. So we've changed the six conditions of training section. We, we have them worded exactly like they are in the regulation. However, you do not have to put the language in here for each of these conditions. Just mark that yes, they've met them. But you do have to still put all that detail in a case note and then attach a copy of that case note to this IEP. 
but you don't have to copy and paste all of that data in each one of these sections anymore. And if they're going to get an industry recognized credential, then you would fill that out here. So we saved you a little bit of effort here. And we look at the case notes. We did we don't normally look at the stuff on here, but make sure you do put the case notes attached to the document. So we yeah. So then you're into your co enrollment section. So this is a participant agreement to co enroll into the OA services. And so you see the boxes here. If no, provide the reason they're ineligible. A lot of times it's they're not they can't register for selective service or they didn't register. Um, and then do they agree to be co enrolled? And then you can do your code, your we owe it services here, any services they're going to receive, you would mark them and if they agree to them, yes or no, and then they're initial. And then the participant responsibilities, we have general responsibilities that they, you know, they maintain monthly contacts, they report any changes to their personal information. And they agree to actively participate in developing this reemployment plan. Then you get into your waiver responsibilities, which come from the old form 3E. And you know, their agreement right here, they agree to these responsibilities. If they're getting a waiver, you would mark that and they would agree to these and date it. Then the training responsibilities, these are from the form 6B. So they would mark, you would mark this, and then they would have to initial and agree to the training requirements. Many responsibilities for them. <clears throat> then we into our breaks in training. If there's any breaks in training more than 30 days, you need to list those if you know them at the time. Or if you find out about them later, you would go back and update this. Uh, then there's the benchmark information where you tell the person about, about the benchmark that they need to meet. And they agree to it and provide their initials. And this, this document is a breathing, living document. You have to update this on a regular basis as can change for this participant along the way. Um, and then here's, of course, the approval. Because the, oh, we need to change that to participant, I see on our form. Um, so we need, there's going to be the participant signature and date. And then the affidavit, you know, stating that it's true to the best ability, whatever. The career planner signs it, a OE director would sign it, approval denial, and then any other comments that you have about it. Are we getting any questions, David? Hi, Sheila. There have been some questions. Um, Susan okay. has been answering them in the chat. Okay, good, good. That's good. That's great. I'll just continue on. <laughs> uh, and then the next section we have is we'll line this form up better, but we want to have the pre approved modifications to the plan as a separate thing. Um, we, we call it modification now because that's what they term it in the regulations. They say modification. So we have different, you know, numbers of modifications, the date, it's going to take effect, the reason. So we have several different reasons that we see a lot of. Um, and then what kind of documentation, you would check box, whatever it is that you have in documentation to support the change. Uh, will they still complete within 130 weeks? And then you get the participant signature, career planner, and OEA director signature. So this, it's not really a lot different. There's just some check boxes that are additional in there that uh, you can use. So that is the IEP. So I'll let Susan continue on with the questions. <laughs> okay, so now we go, oh, 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 going backwards. Okay, so now we get into the waiver, the form three. There's some minor changes to the form and the instructions, nothing major. Um, we did add on the written notices of revocation provided to the participant. We added a question about that to answer. And one key thing about the waiver, we can no longer issue a waiver unless an actual training plan has been developed on the IEP. So it can't be, well, they're still researching their training providers and they're not sure what training they want to go to. It can they have to know at the point that this waiver is issued. That was on one of the calls the other day. I think I don't remember when it was, but it was very. It was they really stressed that. that no, they have to have that training plan in place. I'm going to pull the form three up. Let me find it here. There it is. Okay. Can we see that? Can everybody see that waiver? Is that yes, what's on that's the on the screen. Okay. So we did show 
a whole lot of changes to this up at the top, anything like that. Um, the major change was that we added this right here under the waiver revocation, number 33, written notice of revocation of rights to participants, yes, no, in a, and the date. And the date is when did you provide, when did you send that to them? So it's the form 3D, when did you send it? So that's the only change as far as that form is concerned. Other than that, just minor weeks of planning and things like that. Um, Maybe we did change name of worker groups, location of worker groups, we did do that. But other than that, just very minor changes. For our transportation and subsistence, that's where we get into some major changes. <laughs> so we change it from travel to transportation to align with what the regulations call it. They call it transportation. Um, we added the a different we added types of training on the form, like this, whether it's on site, online, or out of state. We've added the multiple location indicator, and we revised the calculation section. So there's significant changes to the calculations for transportation. Right as of Monday, they can only pay for the mileage that is outside of the commuting area. And currently our commuting area is 10 miles. We are considering lowering it, but that's going to take a little additional work um, with policy, senior management, and some conversations um, around that. So we we were going to work on that, but for now it's a 10. So basically, what this says is any participant who travels 10.1 miles or greater, they get that's one way. Then that they will get the transportation paid from that 0.1 miles over, 0.10 and over. If, if they travel 10 miles or below, then it either has to be paid by another program, the partner program, such as DW, or they just won't get reimbursed for it. Right now, we are waiting on a determination from DOL regarding any participants who currently are receiving transportation payments. So I know we have some customers who are receiving transportation payments that might be that within those ranges that might be affected by this and they may not. So we're waiting on a determination on that about people currently receiving transportation and how we handle those. But for now, any new people coming in on Monday would be under these rules here. In addition to the Mileage for a personal vehicle, public transportation calculations are also affected by this. And we sent a question to Jason at DOL, and we've given you basically our question to him here in bold and what he has said about that. So, the objection this is if a participant, if you can determine like a cost of a ticket from like the closest station to the commuting area boundary. Then you would determine the cost for the ticket for the total commute that goes outside the commuting area, and trade would pay the difference between the two costs of that ticket. It's very confusing. Uh, he gave, you know, it's, and I know the public transportation is a little more challenging. If you do run into some issues with this, you know, call us, contact us. I know we have a couple of areas that do use the public transportation quite a bit, but we do have to account for that commuting distance in there and the participant can only get paid for any transportation outside of that commuting area. So like the 10.1 and above one way. So it'd be 20.1 20, 20 above for a round trip. Anything above um, so let me get the transportation form so you can see it. Let's see what it looks like now. We made some minor changes to the top, just all the just the names, their address. Training institution information, we've added are they attending at one training site? you know, mark that box. If they're attending multiple training sites, then you mark that box, and then you would complete and attach Form 5B. You still need Form 5 to be completed 
because it has all of this certification information over here that goes along with all of it. So the training institution information, if they're attending multiple sites, you can put the training institution information on the multiple site form. Uh, the training period, total number of training days. This is a little different. We, we did have on the old form the number of days per week and the total number of weeks. Well, now we just tell you, now we're just asking you to give us just total number of training days. Uh, type of training, are they attending on site? Then obviously they're going to get, they could, they could be potentially eligible for mileage. If they're online, then you would skip to number 22, which is the certification. So they would not be eligible for transportation subsistence if they're attending all on all online. If they're doing out of state, then you would complete an attached form B to this form, and you would not need to fill this part out for either online or the out of state. You would fill out the other form for out of state. This is this section here is for basically on-site training down here, transportation subsistence calculation. Again, the one-way commute. Um, you need to use this Google Maps assistance to the first decimal place. Um, if Google Maps can't find the address, you can use one of these other ones. The Google Maps needs to be attached to this document when you upload it to IWS for us to review. And then there's a couple of new questions. Are they attending on-site training? Yes, no. Is the net commuting distance more than zero miles? So the net commuting distance, uh, if you take your one-way commute that you have in 15 here, and you subtract 10, and that would give you the distance that they are eligible for to be paid for that one-way commute. And then the net, so the net commuting distance, actually I think I changed that the other day, that's supposed to be 20. No, that's one way, it's only 10, that's right, sorry. So if it is it more than zero, yes. And if yes to both questions, then you would continue on to 18, 19, and 20. And if no to either one of these questions, then they wouldn't be able to transportation system to skip the item to be there. And so then you calculate, this is really no different than the way it was calculated before on the form. It's just everything is just all in one like little box. So your mileage reimbursement, your net commuting distance from 16 here, and you round it to the first decimal. You would do your round trip distance, you multiply that by two. This is no different than the calculation on the current form. The federal mileage rate, and then you calculate your mileage reimbursement, which is your, your 18B, which is your round trip distance times 18C to mileage rate. The round trip cost of any other modes of transportation, and you must deduct that 10 miles from the amount when you're calculating this. We Most people are going to do the public mass transit for those areas that do have that. Um, so then you would put your amount here that any of this would calculate out to. And then your subsistence. So we have separated the lodging rate and the meals and incidentals rate here. And these are from gsa.gov. And you would use the training institution location address to determine what these rates are. And you need to fill this out no matter what. It doesn't matter if you know they're going to get mileage, you still need to fill this out. So then the maximum allowable is this 20C divided by 2. And then you're going to figure your total transportation which is your lesser of this 18B, which is your mileage, 19E, which is your other modes of transportation, and 20D, which is subsistence. So whichever one is lesser of those. However, if 19E is zero, then you would use the lesser of 18D or 20D. And you multiply that times the box number 13, which is the total number of days of training, and that would get you your transportation cost. It's really no different than the way you've been doing it. It's just a little bit more. And then you have your certifications. They're eligible, not eligible. The participant needs to mark that, mark both of these, sign it, date it, for a planner signing date. That's that. So we have a new form, Form 5A, which is the modification form that you would use for any changes to the transportation or consistent. So I'm going to pull that up. So you would put, so it's just one single sheet. You would do one for each modification that you do. You don't have to do a whole number, a whole new 005 form. You would put which modification number this is, 
who was a participant name, the date of the type of fact, and when it was approved by NARC staff. Here are some of the most common reasons that we see for modifications to the mileage or subsistence. We would mark the appropriate box. If there is no appropriate box already listed, we would mark other and give us the, what the reason is, and then give us a justification for the modification. If it affects the mileage, then you would complete this section here with a new daily round trip miles, and that's supposed to be minus 20, so I need to fix that. Uh, the GSA mileage rate, and your so then you would calculate your daily mileage reimbursement by multiplying these two boxes together, and your number of training days, and then your total transportation. So your daily mileage reimbursement times your number of training days and your total transportation. If it affects the subsistence, then you would fill out these boxes. Pretty much the same thing, the lodging rate for the training institution location site, your meals and incidentals rate for that training institution site, your total, which is the sum of these two, and your 50% of that, and then your total subsistence, which would be multiplied by your number of days of training. And if there's a location change, and if a location change, then that would that will affect the given the mile or the subsistence based on what that participant is getting. So you would need to complete both the mile the location change section and either one of these, whichever is applicable. And then how does the modification affect the total cost of training? Does it increase, does it decrease, or is there no change? And then you would put the total new IEC amount. Not the amount of the change, but what the two new amount of the total IEC is based on this change. And your certification, participant, signature date, career plan. Okay. And new form five is the multiple location and out of state subsistence. And that's used for any, you would attach this to the original 005, you would also complete part of the 005, just not the calculation of transportation subsistence on that five thing. But use it for any person who attends at multiple locations, such as nursing students travel to multiple clinical sites, and for any participant who may be attending training out of state and is a patient. These two forms are attached to the original Form 5 after you complete them because the Form 5 does have the certification signature section. Even though we do have signature sections on them, we need that certification section completed and it also has the skill rights on it. So Form 5 does need to be completed in addition to these if you have something like that. Okay. Here is the Form 5B. So the first part, you just put the participant information and the name and the date that you're filling out the form. The multiple locations, you've got, we've got a section for four different addresses. It trip one, you would just put, they go from the residence to location one, location one to location three. Location three back to residence, or fill out however many of these you need to fill out for their trip. You do need to document it with Google Maps. It's attached to this as well when you're completing this. We have room for a trip one, trip two, trip three. I mean, if anybody needs any more than that, feel free to attach another sheet if you need to. And it's calculated all out. Um, and this total transportation here gets summed up between those three lines down here figure out the total cost for the multiple locations. If you have any out of city, then the one one of the questions we need to know is how are lodging costs being paid? Are they being paid directly to the training institution? Are they being paid to another third party? Are they paid by the district? So and then we've got no do not include in lodging rate in 9A, include lodging rate, you know, you know, or you include it or don't include it based on how it's paid. So it's basically the same as calculating on the original Form 5. You're going to do the same mileage reimbursement calculation. Then you're just going to do your subsistence. And then you're going to do an estimate of the actual cost. So if they already know they're going to stay at this site and it's going to cost this much per day, uh, what is the daily meals and incidentals rate from GSA.gov um, estimated, or what do they estimate their actual costs are going to be? And then you would do the lesser of down here, which is the, the mileage, because they get on round trip mileage when they go out of state to go from the residence to the training to location and then their return on the last day. So they do get that. So 
calculate all of that out here. If you need help, if you have an out-of-state customer and you need help with that, then you can call and let me know and I can help you talk through that. Okay. So by, by weekly attendance verification, it, it has changed a little bit. Uh, we've added some questions at the top, number four through six, that the participant needs to answer when they're completing it. We've changed the course attendance section slightly. They're marking a P for present and A for absent. And any absences that they have need to be explained in question number four at the top of the form by the participant. We've removed the problematic questions number nine and 16 that ask about the number of hours not in attendance from the previous form. Those seem to be cause everyone problems and that's what we had a lot of issues with on the previous form, but they need to mark these P and A so we know if they're present or absent. Um, we've added an online course verification requirement statement, what's required for online verification. And we have an additional page again for any participants who may be taking more than four courses. You'll see in a minute. <clears throat> okay. So at the top, we have for the training attendance, we have the participant name, the day, the attendance verification period from Sunday to Saturday. Two week period starts on a Sunday and on Saturday. Um, they have to answer Did you attend all scheduled training during the two week period? But yes or no. If no, they need to explain why. Um, did you drop any courses or have you been terminated by the training institute? Yes or no. And if yes, explain. Uh, provide any from and through dates for any scheduled break in training during the two week period. So the from and through dates for break and the reason for break. You know, it could be, you know, Christmas break, whatever, spring break, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, the training institution location information. If they're attending multiple locations, you will need to do a separate form for each location. Uh, so course one, you put the, again, the, the participants must complete number 12, 13, and 14 section. The instructor completes the, the, the questions 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, for online course verification, it must be made via one of these methods, either an instructor signature on this form, which is right here at number 18, an email from the instructor, or a training institution printout. Now, verification by email from the instructor or the training institution printout must contain the two-week period being verified, the course name and number, the participant name, and they must answer questions 15, 16, 17 on that verification. So make sure that that is attached to this document. They still need this document, even if it's online, because they need the participant needs to certify that there's no intention to commit fraud, and they're attesting to the fact that this is true and correct what is on this form. They've attended these courses that are listed. So we have three one here for four courses. Um, we got the week one, week two, so Sunday through Saturday. You just mark a P. They would mark a P in the box for any day they're present and an A for any data or absence, and any absences need to be indicated up here in line four and explained. Mm -hmm. Then we have the course five, six, and seven for anybody who would attend any extra courses other than just four. Um, if you need multiple ones, you can always add another sheet. Hopefully no one's getting that. So RTAA. There are some minor changes to the language on the application, and it's in the very beginning paragraph, and it basically relates to how overtime wages and bonuses will be taken into calculations now, and monetary redetermination, excuse me to say, will be made regularly for its RTA. Job search. So here are the forms that we use for job search. There have been some significant changes to job search. Um, we're working on updating the forms and the instructions. And like I said, if you do encounter a job search uh, contact, I put my name first because Susan doesn't like math, it's still tough. But if I'm not available, you can call her too. <laughs> but if you do need further assistance, if you do have a participant who does request some job search, then let us know and we'll walk that and help you. But we will provide updated training when we have the forms updated and the instructions and policy and all that. So stand, stand by for job search. Uh, as a lot of you have probably 
know by now the state fair staffing provision has changed. Uh, in 618, 890, it's staffing flexibility. The new regulations allow the provision of case management services by non-state parent staff. Um, state parent staff are still required to make final determinations of eligibility for any CAA program benefits. So the requirements for submission of approvals has not changed at the, our state level. And you have to still do exactly what you've been doing all along. The thing that it has allowed us to do, though, is now we can put some case management money in the field to pay for the salaries of those case managers um, who are providing services to the, to the participants. That's really all that's changed. Everything else remains the same. Susan and I will still be doing approvals just like we always have. Um, they'll still have to submit everything to us for approval. Sorry. Um, here's some like websites and some resources, um, the, the WorkNet trade forms, which I said you will be getting these updated forms on WorkNet. We're going to try to get them out there today. Uh, we will let you know as soon as they're out there um, and available. Please go to WorkNet to get the most recent version of the form for any customers that you are working with, especially beginning, well, beginning on Monday for sure. And then here's the, the Department of Labor Trade Center website. This has changed from previous uh, from the previous site they had. So if you had this as if you had their website as a link or something, you may want to make sure you have the correct link there. Um, here's IWDS, GSA.gov, where you can get your travel and per diem rate. Uh -huh. Backwards. And then here is the website to get the new TA program regulations copy, and then here's for the trade act, if you would like those. I'm going backwards. Here are the, the CEO trade contacts, Susan, myself, Crystal, and Lori. Um, so we're cutting it right now. I would suggest not using our phone numbers, although this is my, my work cell number, so you can use that number. The best way to contact us, though, right now is via email because we are still working remotely at this point. Uh, we don't know, you know, when we'll be going back, but we are still working remotely and still functioning just like we have. We just not sit in our office. Here are the IBES trade unit contacts, and then here is their phone number to contact if you have any questions. I know they have been crazy busy assisting the other part of IDES with some UI issues and questions from all the people. Um, so try to be patient. Um, you, you could probably email them also if you have a question. So just be patient. I know they're, they're really inundated and crazy over there, just like we all are. And are there any questions? Hi, Sheila. So, yeah, there were a couple um, points that um, some individuals asked for clarification. Um, one of them was if you could please explain the ITA section of the IEP again, especially the areas of testing and certifications, and they wanted to know what was covered through TAA. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, right here for the cost. So, okay, the testing and certification. So, if you've got a nursing student and they're going to be doing their, you know, do taking their NCLEX, I guess I think that I think that's what it's called. We can pay for that test. We can pay for, you know, if they need to take any kind of a special certification, um, you know, any kind of a test or certification for, like the program that they train for. If there's a required test or certification thing that we can pay for that. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Um, I think, if possible, could you show that form again? Which form? The ITA form? Um, oh, I... oh, oh, I haven't shared it. Uh, duh. Hold on. <laughs> I guess it helps if I share, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, right here, the total trade cost where it has a testing certification. 
Yeah, that's for, you know, like I said, any, like a student who has trained in a certain field and there's some sort of a, you know, a test that's required for them to get some sort of a certificate that they uh, will obtain as a part of that program. So that is what, that is where you would put those costs right here. That's new because previously they really, they didn't allow us to do some of that in the previous regulation. And then there was another one from uh, regarding the IEP. If you could please explain the prerequisite again. Oh, okay. Okay, prerequisite. Prerequisite for a training program would be um, if, the only one I can really think of that comes to my mind right now, but like, um, like is, is a nursing student. Um, so they have a series of courses, a series of things that they have to do. Like, you know, you have to be a CNA before you can go to be an LPN. So if someone needs some classes that they need to take, they want to do nursing, they want to do RN, and they need to take these classes here, whatever the series of classes are, before the college will actually accept them into the RN program, that is what the prerequisites are. If it's required before they can be accepted into an actual type of a training program, uh, you know, whatever program it is. I'm, nursing is the only thing that's coming to my mind right off the top of my head. I, I can't think of any others um, that I can recall. There's very few programs that would require a prerequisite training. Um, sometimes the colleges get confused and they, they say it's a prerequisite, but it's like it's really not in our terminology anyway. It is for them, but in our terminology, it's not. We, it is, we are saying it is so that they, they have to take these before they can get accepted into this training program. Not you got to take Biology 101 before Biology 102. The colleges would consider that a prerequisite. Yeah, Dana, mostly it's healthcare. I, I, I'm not thinking of one off the top of my head that comes to mind that we've had maybe potentially before that would require any prerequisites, but a lot of us is healthcare at this point. Yes, Lorraine, yes, you still have to outline how the six conditions have been met. That is still required in the case notes, just like always. You just don't have to put them on the IEP as you have before. You just have to attach the case note detail to the IEP. So, yes, none of that has changed. You still have to detail all of that out. We're working on the questions that need to be answered to meet those six criteria. Um, hopefully we can have an update here in a couple of weeks or a month or so. We're going to work on streamlining those questions that you have to answer for each of those criteria. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about the slides, um, unless, David, is there a way to upload them or something on WorkNet with the um, the PowerPoint? Yeah, we can add that to WorkNet. Okay, all right. And, um, so I can send it to you, David, and then you can send me back the link of where they can find the recording and the slides and everything. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that'll be great. okay I'll email that out. Uh, yeah, we're, Dana, we will be putting the forms out there on WorkNet, um, hopefully by the end of today, and we will let everyone know when they're available. Okay. 
And number five, so that a class is dropped. Um, I'm not understanding, Dana, when you say once you see the tenants again, is number five filled out the class is dropped. Are you talking about the form five? Dana, can you respond in the chat as to what your question was about if is number five filled out of classes dropped about attendance? Let me get the attendance form. Number five. Yeah, if, if they drop a class, then they need to fill out number five. Definitely. When they're turning in this bi weekly attendance, they need they need to fill that out. If they drop classes, they need to explain why. Because the thing is if you drop courses, it could drop them below full time, which would affect their eligibility for TRA or could affect it. <laughs> That's specifically what that question or if they just drop a class on the, for that number five on the bi weekly, then <clears throat> okay. Oh, oh, if the student dropped a course but then picked up another to take its place, I think he's asking whether the drop class still needs to be recorded on his inbox. It they should mark that, but they should explain drop this one but pick this one up. That that would be the best option to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then when someone is monitoring that, if they see that by by weekly attendance, and the thing is if someone does do that, one thing that their career planner needs to do is get an updated schedule to put in that file to show that change in that schedule for that custom that participant because that is something we will look at. Like, oh, okay, well this says they're supposed to be attending this course, but this course is here now. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Any other questions that Susan or I haven't answered? I don't know. You see any David or Susan that we haven't answered? Uh, not that I'm currently aware of. Um, okay. Susan, if you think otherwise you can unmute uh, by pressing star six. Uh, in the chat, so we have a record of it. Uh, is there still a field somewhere on the revised transportation forms to indicate that public transportation is not viable feasible? Um, <clears throat> there's no field specifically there. Um, but, I mean, if it's, if public transportation is not viable or feasible, then you just don't include it. You would just do the mileage. And you, you can put it as a part of the case note for the sixth condition when you're talking about transportation. The biweekly verification form, well, that, the main part for the course attendance and stuff, that should be filled out by, most of this should be filled out by the, custom, the participant itself. I mean, if the career planner wants to fill out some of the information ahead of time, they can. I know some career planners fill in the participant name, and the two week period and then give them copies for the whole entire semester. I've seen that happen 
the participant definitely needs to fill out question four, five, and six. Um, the training institution information, that could be filled in ahead of time if they're only attending one site, or you know, if they're attending multiple, you can both see. Uh, you know, they can fill in the course name and numbers. I mean, if, if the career planner has, the, has an option to fill out some of the information, but as far as the attendance, that is the, and the questions at the top, the participant has to fill that out, they have to sign. They certifying that everything on there is true and correct, and they've not, they're not trying to commit fraud. So it's kind of a combination, Omar. Um, about the NCLEX review course, I think Susan stated we can't, we're, we're, we think we have the answer to that, but we're not sure right now what that answer was. Um, our brains are kind of fried these days. We've been looking at forms and stuff for several weeks in a row, but we will get back to you on that question about the NCLEX review course. Anything else? Um, for students at a junior college attending online, is an email answering the question? Um. As long as, you know, it, they indicate, like online, I know it's kind of, um, so this is for Monica's question. For students at a junior college attending online, is an email answering the present absent questions allowable? Yeah, they can they can say they attended all, you know, as long as you indicate the two week period, the course name and number, that participant name, they answer those questions about, you know, attending all the schedule classes, how they they're successfully progressing through the list of course, and if there is if there's any absences, they need to identify what those absences are. As long as that instructor is verifying that yes, that person attended all scheduled classes, then yes, that's acceptable. But there's you can't it can't just be yeah there you know it's it, it, you've got to identify those key points because some, we have seen cases where it was just a copy paste and then they didn't copy paste very well and. They had, a, they had a date from two months ago, but they were trying to verify this period here. I mean, it has to be, it, you have to identify that two-week period and those key information. But yeah, it, it doesn't have to be set on the form if it's in an email from the instructor and all of those key elements are there. So, Diana, we do have public transportation in our area. However, people could have to make several transfers on the bus line or bus route. Would that still be considered to be available even if you take the two hours to school? Uh, I'm not thinking that would be very feasible for them to take two hours to get to school. <laughs> um, but I think a justification could be made in that case that, you know, the time factor could play into that. And Susan may have another comment but on that, but I mean that's my that's my opinion on it. I don't think we would demand that someone take bus routes. It's going to take two hours to get to school. If those, if that is different, then you know we'll get back to you on that bus and all that kind of stuff. So, okay, this is the email I sent Ms. Darker during COVID-19. Is this okay? So, client James Tucker by with the attendance, chief emails for period, okay, course title, okay, yes, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's tell her some attendance reason for absence. Has a two-week period. It has the course name and number. It has the participant name, and it answers the question. 
Oh, there's an extra question on that one when you were doing it in the code. Yeah, because our questions have now changed a little bit. Um, yeah, some list reason for any app. Yes, as long as it's a legitimate email from the instructor, not there's a copy and paste of something from a previous time, yes, we would accept that as a verification for attendance. Yes, it's easy as it is. That's not reasonable, so private vehicle is the most appropriate mode of transportation in that case with a two hour bus ride. Yeah, because now you can justify it, then, you know, yeah, it's, it's, they're not going to make someone go out of their way significantly to attend training. Anything else? Not seeing any. So, since there are no more questions, if you do have additional questions, you can email us. Um, we will get a transcript from the chat and get it out to everyone. We'll let you know when the forms are on WorkNet, so you can go get those. Um, these new forms should be used starting Monday. Um, and the attendance sheet, yes, please start using these for any customers currently in training. As of Monday, there's nothing in here that is really that significant of a change or specific to the new regulations. We just tried to make it a little simpler. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. I don't know. Some people think we did, some people think we didn't. Uh, but yes, there's all of these forms beginning on Monday for everything. Um, we will get them out there on WorkNet and let you know as soon as they are. Any additional questions, let us know. And we will have further training coming up, and we will let you all know when those are going to happen. Um, and we are working on our policy. Like I said, um, we anticipate policy being done hopefully by the end of October, first part of November, potentially. And we'll do some more training on job search and reload as soon as we have that information updated and some and anything else that we find out from DOL um, and after we attend some other training from DOL. All right, well, I guess that's it. And if there's any additional questions or anything we didn't get answered, we will definitely answer those um, and get the answers out to everyone. So thank you for attending. We appreciate it. And I guess that's it.